Cool, man. Thanks for doing this. Not easy. Rainy day in Girona. Um, really rainy day. What have you been getting up to today? Rest day. So just, yeah, sorting things out. Rest days, yeah, what I was saying before, it's usually some of the busiest days. So this morning, uh, bike maintenance, sorting some things out for the rest of the week. Make sure it's close enough. Um, yeah, borrowing a, my altitude tent that I have is up in Andorra at the moment. So borrowing an altitude tent of a, of a guy here and getting that set up. And yeah, just a bit of groundhog day at the moment, eh? Hey? Yeah. Like, just basically that's what winter is, just... Lots of work, short days, um, lots of thinking about the next season, and yeah, man, all happening. Yeah. So you do you have a place in Andorra? Yeah, yeah so I got an apartment up there. So I'm between uh, Andorra and Girona. So yeah. usually the weather's like it is. Then Girona's a bit of a safe haven from the snow and stuff. Um, and also this time of year, there's plenty of people about and good groups to go on riding with. And trails are in much better condition and not under snow. So yeah, usually Girona's the go-to over winter. Yeah. Yeah, I did a, is it Oish Bidget loop yesterday where you go up to Comperdon. Oh, sick. And around, and it was my first time like kind of getting up into the Pyrenees properly. And I was just like, man, I could definitely post up here for a while. Oh, bro, it's unreal, eh? Like yeah. Comperdon, I did a ride out there a couple of years ago with some mates in the off season. It was just like five and a half hour epic. Yeah. And like the last climb, we ended up walking the last like, yeah, half an hour, 20 minutes, maybe longer. That's just my memory now. So maybe it was longer at the time, but got to the top and like the the cloud cover was about 100 meters under the hill we're on so it was just like a sea of cloud and then we that bomb down on the bikes and then you're going through the the cloud cover it's like literally five or ten meters of like visibility as you're going and we're hauling and i was just thinking like if we catch a cow oh. or livestock like we are dead meat eh? so it was sick but yeah the whole area like we're so privileged and so blessed to be riding here like costa brava on the roads yeah. Drivers are really considerate in Spain. Um, something's not so common in New Zealand. Uh, and yeah, just yeah, the landscape, the mountain bike trails, everything. It's full package. So pretty stoked to be living here, to be honest. Yeah, it is unreal. It's almost, I mean, for me, I almost feel guilty for doing five road rides in a row and not getting out on the mountain bike because I know the mountain biking is so good. But then the road riding is so good. You just, it, it's almost like overload in terms of the potential. Yeah. Um, how long have you been here? So, yeah, it's in Girona, or in this area, since basically 2018. Uh, before that, you know, like I was, uh, I lived in Austria. Well, I'll go back to the start, actually, just my whole European, because just yeah. like, chopping and changing so much. But so I first decided that I want to come over to Europe and race mountain bikes when, oh, for the first proper campaign I did was my last year under 19, so when I was 17. Before that, I did uh, the fir my first World Championships in Leo Gang on the XC back in 20 2012. Oh, yeah. Time flies. Time does fly. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, the next year I decided, like, I got 46 at the Worlds. I was, like, nine minutes down, but I still thought I was going to be good or thought I could still do something, you know, I still believed. And so uh, a great guy, Adrian Retief, uh, he was traveling as well that year in, in Europe. He was a Kiwi guy. Um, and so I traveled with him and we basically just lived out of a car and traveled from race to race. And towards the end of the, and it was some of the best memories I've ever had, to be honest. Like, uh, so how you were 18 at this point, 17, Seven, geez, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so actually probably my most, one of my most memorable memories in life. Well, definitely with the sport anyway, I was, we did the Andorran world cup, uh, and yes, yeah, so 2013. So Andorran world cup. And we were staying with people that had to become really important to me now. Uh, with the salesmans um it's a austrian family yodok the brother uh good friends of him and absolute legend of him nice people you ever meet um and so they offered us to stay there for a week and we we're going back to the andorra from the andorra cup there and adrian was the only one who was able to drive because i was too young uh, <laughs> i fell asleep in the car after the race and yeah i woke up one o'clock or so in the morning i was in the driver's on uh, the passenger seat and the driver's doors open no adrian and oh. i'm just like all right, this isn't normal. Like, let's try to find out where Adrian is. And I got out of the car and looked up, and it's like full white cliffs. And it was full moon. Well, I remember being able to see a bit, but it was pitch black basically. And I could just see the white cliffs. And then I realized I was like Infinite de Guerra. And so on the right of me, I looked, and there's Adrian sleeping on one of the beach decking chairs. No way. In the water. Yeah, yeah. So I just remember sitting there thinking, like, wow, this is living. Like, I'd be in high school back in New Zealand if I wasn't doing this. And this is fucking sweet so yeah. yeah it was it was cool um 
but then yeah towards the end of that year i went back to the sales we went back to the salesman to hang out and they said oh what are your plans for next year and i was sort of oh, i don't know and they said all oh, right you're staying with us hmm. and it was a lot of the reason why i've got to be yeah have the career that i've had is because of that family um and so i went there and i ended up living there for two years or two seasons hmm. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. I took some adjustment. Like I tried to do my laundry and I wasn't allowed to. I was trying to do dishes and I wasn't allowed to. And they were just the hospitality was incredible. Huh. Um, and so I lived in uh, Dornbin, Austria, for a couple of years when I was racing. Uh, this was when you were were you on Specialized Factory yet at this point? No, not yet. So it was my first, my last year as a privateer. I lived with them, um, and then my first year as a pro was Specialized. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, it was amazing. And then a couple of years on, I'd signed with spe- uh, Specialized. I yeah, I got quite close with my teammates, Simon and Drazen. And we decided to move into each other in Freiburg in Germany. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know a lot of guys from there. And so, yeah, did a year in Freiburg, Germany. And, yeah, we, yeah, us two youngsters trying to organize anything. Um, yeah, we, we thought we had an apartment in Freiburg, but we had an apartment in some small village, like 25K away from Freiburg. <laughs> yeah. So we just camped out there basically and did the season. Uh, and then, yeah, obviously after that, we were both wanting to do different things and, I had a lot of mates down in Girona, so I came down here mid-season break in, yeah, 2017, so a bit longer than two years I was in Lumpen. Yeah. Um, decided I loved it, and yeah, 2018 I came down here, and here you are. Man, that's wild. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about how you got to be that 17-year-old that was sleeping in your vehicle, trying to make the dream work, because you grew up, or I don't know if you grew up, but you were born in a, sounds like a really small town in, in the middle of the North Island of New Zealand. Yeah. A uh, little farming community, kind of? Like yeah, yeah. 12,000, 14,000 people, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was born in a place called Tokara in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's a small farming town. Uh, to be honest, I actually lived on a dairy farm all my, well, did dairy farms all my life. So, huh. you know, like it was in the back of nowhere, but we just went to the town if we needed supplies or something like this. Uh, and yeah, just had a pretty conservative start to life basically eh? like my first I went to a school to, called Tiwotu school for my first school and I was only there for a year because usually how it works in farming is you move on every three years and my dad was management in the management role of farms mm. and so he liked to keep moving every three years not to get too stale um and so then I went from Tiwotu school they probably off the top of my head probably like 300 pupils uh, 200 or so and I went out to a place called Pekanui Road out back in Nutanui uh and that school had six students. Six? Yeah, three of them were me and my brothers. <laughs> so literally gays, boys took up half the, the school population. No um, way. And so, yeah, but it was free to roam, bro. Like it was pretty sick. Like we had days where the, the local motorbike shop came out and had let us have Tesco's on the motorbikes ripping up the school field. Um, rode my bike to school every day and had it under the deck out the back. Literally was free to roam. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a pretty cool experience actually, but... Yeah, from there, um, I went to Hamilton. I went to, yeah, just a normal intermediate school uh, in the surrounding town called Tiamutu, and then to Hamilton Boys, which big city, big high school, uh, pretty traditional, boys only, uh, semi private. So that took some adjustment for sure. Uh, they had a good cycling program there, so I was able to start getting into it from there. And then, yeah, decided that, uh, well, my dream to be the as fast as I could be on a bike was since I can remember, you know, like literally my first memory is three years old crashing a motorbike that I got for the first time. So yeah, I've always wanted to do it. But then when I went to Hamilton Boys, I actually had a bit more of a pathway and a bit more idea of how I was going to do it. You know? Yeah. Was there a role model that made you dream of being a pro cyclist or how did that even make it onto your radar? Because I mean, in New Zealand, there's certainly... Some amazing cyclists that have come there. Does George Bennett still live in Girona, by the way? Yeah, he's mostly up in Andorra now, I think, okay. at the moment. Yeah, so, I mean, there's plenty of Kiwis that have made it big, but um, I wouldn't call it a national sport from what I can tell. Like, that would obviously be rugby. Why do you think the bike was the thing that, that drew you in? Uh, my dad, okay. you know, plain and simple. Uh, my dad was my hero, he still is. Um, and yeah, so when I started, I we started a motocross. I was got my first motorbike, yeah, just three years old, like I said, and we got into motocross as a family and went along there. Uh, it got too expensive for the family, and so we turned to push bikes. Little did we know it's gonna be even more expensive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, <that's> so true. <laughs> and yeah, Dad used to—he's a keen uh, amateur cyclist from New Zealand, and 
you know, to be honest, I think he could have been quite good if he picked it up young, but, you know, he got into it late 20s uh, in the effort to stop smoking, uh, <laughs> which actually was a, yeah, a bit of a healthy hobby for him, which turned into a bit of an obsessive one. So, yeah, eventually, you know, I got into the domestic scene and I started, yeah, racing the mountain bike, just the national cups and so forth from under 17, under 15 age group. But then, you know, the schoolboy racing on the road was quite an easy pathway and you know two of my best mates well, my two best mates were both racing back then at the same time um and so we did that a lot together and that was the easiest way and then so basically the mountain bike was just more of a, a fun part of it and the road racing was really serious for me and schoolboys. Mm. and then uh yeah the more i got on i well actually i went to yeah the, my first ever time representing the country was this road stage race in uh australia and i won the king of the mountains jersey want to mm. catch me doing that now <laughs> but, I'm like 20 kid. but then I actually realized then that I'm not going to be good enough to go professional on the road. Um, huh. And so, yeah, I was scoring. What do you mean you, you realized? Like, what was there a moment where you just got frustrated? And well, Yeah, I mean, it was on the mountain bike. If you're good, you're good, you know. And like, let's say you're with one or two riders. If you're the strongest, you can get away from it, you know. Uh, on the road, it's just such a dense field. And there's so much quantity of good bike riders. Um, and so I really struggled to have the confidence in myself to be able to make a difference in that. And so I thought the mountain bike was going to be it. Because, um, yeah, I mean, there were some great riders back then that I used to race. Like there was a guy called Jack Edwards. He isn't racing anymore, but he was around the same age as I was. He's an Australian guy. But this guy was incredible. And I remember doing like this race called Yunker Tour. It's like, this, it's like the junior tour of Southland. And tour of Southland is like – the biggest race in New Zealand. Everyone, they call it like the fourth grand tour down there, you know? <laughs> um, and I was doing Yunker tour and Jack, we're coming to a bunch sprint and I watched this, this massive Australian kid and I watched him weave his way through like 20 guys and then win the sprint going up the middle of the bunch. <laughs> and I was like, I'd never be able to do that. Yeah. So then like things like this, just like, oh yeah, I'm not making it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then I turned back to the mountain bike and yeah, I had some great battles in New Zealand with some guys like, you know, Carl Jones. Uh, he was one of the top, riders in the country uh had some great battles of him he was a few years older than me um and then obviously anton we raced quite a lot as a uh, youth category back there and then yeah coming up to europe and here we are yeah so the first memory i have of you the first time i became familiar with your name uh i don't remember what year it was and it had to have been a world champs because i remember you were in a, a new zealand kit uh and it was an eliminator race and it was it was back in the day. I guess it would have been red. I don't think it was free caster days. That would have been before your time a little bit. It must have been early days of Red Bull TV. Rob Warner was announcing, um, and you you were this like rangy, pretty skinny, like gangly New Zealand kid that was just not getting knocked out. You just <laughs> kept coming through the rounds, kept coming through the rounds, and I just remember thinking, who is this kid? Because there were pretty well-known riders doing eliminators at that point. And uh, you were just kind of like this dark horse that, at least for me, as someone that was a fan of the sport, like I wasn't familiar with their na with your name. And I was just like, who is this kid? And you, I think you had to have been like 18, 19. Do you remember yeah, what this race was? 18, it's the King 6 cc And like, yeah, just I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah, <laughs> I was just... Yeah, basically, I was still privateering it, and uh, Yodok, uh, myself, uh, Matt Waghorn, old mate, um, and a bunch of guys went over to Kins to this World Cup, and the Eliminator was on. I thought, oh, okay, I'd give it a so go. So it was a World Cup? Yeah, it was a World you, Cup. You were in national, yeah, national was, team kit because you didn't have a team? No. Basically, got yeah, it. Okay, yeah, 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 that makes more sense. Yeah, I was actually borrowing my ex-girlfriend's little brother's New Zealand skin suit, which was like four <laughs> yes. times too small for me, so. That's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, dude. So I'm, that was when I met Benno Willett, who's yeah. the manager of Specialized Racing. Great guy. Um, and yeah, I was there by myself. It was hosing down rain. Yeah. Um, I had no support. I don't know what I was doing. Um, and he decided to take pity on me and just hang out with me and do the race and qualifying. I don't remember what I got, but I was in the rounds. And yeah, it was, like you said, I just wasn't getting knocked out somehow. Um, and every round and get more, more Ben I could see Ben I get more and more excited and yeah. I don't know this guy from Bar of Soap at the time and I could just see he's getting super excited and I was like also getting a bit excited like I never thought I could actually do it but I was like oh, I'm getting close getting close and then don't know mate just in the final something came over me I just went Harry Harden nuts out of the gate <laughs> didn't look back and 
yeah, somehow I managed to pull it off. So yeah, yeah it was it was sick. Um, and for those that don't know, so this is pre XCC era. So before short tracks in the World Cup, there were eliminators, which are it's ba- it's like four cross, uh, but instead of jumps and downhill, it's sort of like a mini cross country version. So yeah, there's rounds of four riders. Top two move on, bottom two get eliminated, and you have these heats until there's just a final four left. Yeah, it's like a minute long race, so it's basically yeah. like it's a minute long, or you can go on super painful, stuff. like kind of a screwy format, but really exciting. Yeah, and I just remember you being this like super rangy. It seemed like you were almost a little bit uncoordinated at the time, but you could just see like the pure talent, just like <laughs> kind of oozing out of you in a way. And I was like, who is this guy? And yeah. you, you just kept beating people. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah, I mean, I still am rough around the edges, but I was definitely <laughs> rough around the edges back then, you know? Like, yeah, it's, it's a good memory. But yeah, somehow it worked out. And I remember it was the first time I had champagne on a podium. <laughs> yeah. Got in my eyes and I was so pissed I forgot my helmet and shoes and the, and the doping control. Really? So the manager of the team, <laughs> then I had to bring back my shoes and helmet the next day. Um, but yeah, I remember getting the prize money. I spent it straight on Oakleys. Um, that is so got some, awesome. Yeah, got some new specs. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, it was just the beginning of the beginning of it all. I so mean, what it, happened? So what happened right after that? Because Benno kind of had to be like, "Oh my God, who is this kid that I just stumbled across?" Did conversations start immediately, or how did how did the next handful of months play out? So he was open arms. Like obviously, okay. I didn't sign that season, but you know he offered his support at all the races and all of a sudden they're helping out with the tech zone and looking after my bike and stuff. Um, and it was great. Like he was, Benno was a massive part to it that season and we had a lot of conversations throughout the season and, you know, actually bringing it back a little bit, actually a long time ago now, I did know Benno before Ken's because I was under 19, I was a little grommet hanging out the front of the tent trying to get a contract. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Since that's how it works. Yeah. Kids, that's not how it works. But. <laughs> that's not how it works. Um, but yeah. Um, so I snapped my frame, I broke out the bottom, uh, the bottom bracket of the specialized bike that I paid for uh, through the national importer. And so they gave me an old frame in under 19. So I was already was familiar with Benno. Um, but then, yeah, 2014, he just... That was the first time that he actually had really uh, had one less degree of separation with my racing, was actually able to be there and support it. And so then I think hopefully won him over with that short, uh, with the XCE. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, yeah, he was looking after me throughout the 23 season. And that was my first year as under 23. Um, and it just went really well. Like I was still riding my hardtail and I went to the Nova Mesta World Cup and somehow got third. Um, which if I try to do that on a hard tail these days, I'd break my back. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Rudiest track there is pretty much. Yeah, it's rough as guts, that one. Um, but then, yeah, just kept supporting and then ended up uh, Com Games was that year, Commonwealth Games, my first Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. I got silver. Uh, this is in U23? This is my first year, U23, yeah. Yeah, first year. And then we had uh, the World Championships in Hafjö in Norway that year. Mm. And... I don't know, I've had it a few times in my career where just something's different, you know, like just the legs don't hurt and I can go as hard as I like. And that, well, that was one of those days, um, the first one I actually had. And I remember getting to that event and I still had my hardtail and it was a rough course and, <laughs> you know, wheels out this epic. And I said, oh, can I use it for the race? I thought I was just going to use it for the race and give it back. He goes, no, this is yours. Oh. And it was the first free bike I got. No way. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, are you sure? Because I knew like, I knew the value of these things because I had my bike back paid that I need to pay off for the next two years, you know? So I knew that it was a big thing that was getting given to me. He just gave it to me willy-nilly. It was actually Todd Wales' old World Cup frame. From that no year. way. So I was like, huh. sick. Yeah. Um, so then the race itself, I just, things connected and I was in the leading group and oh, I was like, gosh, little. So I had like my gloves that I was second lap in and I felt so good, but I wanted to impress the manager of S racing. So there I'm going through tech zone, like hands off the bars, taking my glove off one finger at a time and stuff, you know, looking back, I'm just like, oh my God. Um, <laughs> and so then I, <laughs> I attack with like two and a half laps to go. And I was with Sir Jordan Saru, Victor Kuretsky, Michel van der Heiden. I uh, was in the leading group and I looked back and I had clear tra- uh, track and I was leading the world champs of first year on the 23. 
maybe like two and a half laps to go. I'm thinking I've done this. But in my head, I was feeling so good. I was just like, just sprint everywhere I go. Like, Mm -hmm. screw it, why not? And then I was throwing down on the jumps, like just young Sam in full flight mode. Um, And there's this jump line and then there's this fast left-handed corner with some rocks on it. And I was sprinting through the thing and I clipped my pedal on one of those rocks, went over the handlebars and broke my wrist. And And I was out of the race. I don't remember this. That's crazy. Yeah, I was... Yeah, it was, oh, it was wow. a quick change of mentality. And yeah. so, like, I tried to get back on the bike and get moving. Jordan came flying by, and then I was like, oh, no, I've got my bike's broken. Try to straighten my bars. And I was like, oh, my wrist, like, I looked at my wrist, and I was like, oh, that's definitely gone. You could see that it was broken. I couldn't see, but it was puffing up, yeah. and I could, I could feel it was yeah. gone. Um, and then, yeah, I went into the tech zone, which was literally a minute away, and put a towel over my head and cried my eyes out, and that was <sighs> that. So... But then a week after that, I got my contract from Specialized Racing. Um, <laughs> Jeez, absolute roller coaster. Yeah, absolute roller coaster. And yeah, to be honest, I'm really glad I had it because, you know, my, my parents, my dad was funding my campaign and my family was funding my campaign. But yeah, we were struggling to get by with it. And it was literally my last chance before I had to get a day job and give up on the dream. So if I didn't get the contract that yeah, I probably would be a complete different person right now. Um, really? Wow. Yeah, so it's, it worked out how it did. And, yeah, the next year I came over and, you know, those first that first season, 2015, I really adjusting to being a professional athlete because, yeah, you know, I was just some farm boy from the bottom of the world. It was, yeah, rough diamond and just, yeah, like I said, rough around the edges. Like I had a lot to learn about being a professional athlete. And I learned a lot in 2015, but, you know, I wasn't but doing the extraordinary things I was doing in 2014 and, it didn't all really start clicking until 2016. Huh. Why do you think why do you think 2015 was a little bit of a harder year? Because it seems like to that point, obviously things weren't coming easily, but you found yourself with very little experience in these amazing positions in the middle of races. What was it about 2015 that was kind of more challenging? I think it was more just getting used to my reality of life at that point. Because until then it was a complete different reality of what I had, you know, like and also, yeah, I had a lot of stuff going on when I was in high school and as a kid, so I was sort of trying to digest that or work, start working my way through that as well as being a professional athlete and I was filled, while well, the rooms that I was in were suddenly filled with the world's best athletes. Yeah. And coming into that, there was a bit of imposter syndrome, there was a bunch of confidence that I needed to gain and, you know, externally I think I was quite a confident young guy but internally it was quite the opposite I think so getting used to that was definitely a hurdle um and just how the business structure of professional cycling works you know because until then like yeah when you grow up on a farm with six people in your school mate like everyone's your mate you know yeah. we're going into yeah, the professional yeah. bike industry it's yeah. the relationships are completely different and different dynamics there so getting used to that but yeah like I had a lot of good times in 2015 but I definitely you know also that yeah, 2015 is the year that I met Christoph Sauser. Mm, mm-hmm. And Christoph Sauser has done an incredible amount for me in my career. And a lot of things that I do these days and habits that I have with my training and racing come from Christoph Sauser. Uh, he's my, you know, he, was, he started coaching me when I was in the team there, um, basically mentoring me. And that was really the, the beginning of turning me into a professional athlete in a way. Um, and yeah, 2016 of him was a lot of fun too. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> to race the World Cup full-time, obviously you grad- your life has to gradually kind of become more European, spend more time here, base here. You just mentioned that, you know, your your coach is European. A lot of your teammates, obviously, are based in Europe. Most of the races are in Europe. What was it like to transition away from kind of backcountry, New Zealand, humble beginnings, farming family, all that sort of thing, and um, did you kind of have one eye looking back over your shoulder ever, or was it so exciting that you were just kind of eyes forward and, and, and cha- in chase mode the whole time? No, I mean, that's probably the biggest challenge. One of the biggest challenges I've had as a professional cyclist is, is the, where I am and like what I'm doing in Europe and moving my life over here, you know, like it was, Definitely something which I didn't, at the time, you know, it was all exciting and all new and I was off to do this great adventure and beats, yeah, going to high school, going to uni. Um, I did high school, but my last year of high school, I 
got my university entrance and left. So, you know, like I was missing out on some things, but then it was really exciting what I was doing. And, you know, actually as time went on, I, yeah, I, it was definitely a, a struggle and it still is a bit of a struggle, you know, like my family's back there. Um, my big brother has his family now of his three daughters and amazing wife and parents are getting on and, you know, like the sacrifices that you have to make from New Zealand or other continents to come to Europe sometimes can be pretty big that people don't necessarily understand. Um, but no, I mean, it's definitely hard, like friendships, for instance, uh, relationships and a bunch of things like that whole dynamic changes when you're on the other side of the world the whole time, you know, and I'm really lucky. I have a really great group of friends and great group of people in my life, you know, and like a lot of my, my close mates back home in New Zealand completely understand it these days and I like to think they're quite proud that I'm chasing something, which I am, um, which means a lot. And, you know, family, uh, relationships, that whole dynamic changed. And so, yeah, it's definitely been interesting. Um, but then you weigh it off with the fact that, like, you know, my perspective of life living on the other side and seeing so many different corners of this world and, yeah. you know, that changes also how you think about it and the person you are. So I'm really grateful for the, that perspective it's given me. Um, of course, you know, the ultimate goal is to go as fast as I can on two wheels, but collectively what I've gained as an individual throughout this journey has been probably the thing that will I remember the most, the longest, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I want to keep kind of rolling through the, the chronology of your career a little bit, but one question that comes to mind that's maybe a little bit out of left field is, um, you know, you're you're at this phase in your career where you've won – a whole bunch of races. How many world titles do you have now between you, 23, and everything? Between you, 23, and elites, I've got five. Five. So that's a lot. That's Most people don't ever win one. <laughs> you've got five. Pretty awesome. But you're chasing this elite world title, obviously, which you've been this past year closer to than ever before. But <clears throat> I also, at least for me, I don't know that everyone goes through this, but I've talked to some of my my buddies that race professionally as well about this. Once you start getting a little bit closer to 30 or you turn 30 different people kind of start uh you're obviously you're still very focused on your goals but you maybe start having some thoughts about what you're going to do post-career or maybe it's not even post-career but other other ways you kind of want to carve out a little bit of extra time just to experience the world a little bit more broadly because at this point you've been fully focused on this dream for a decade right um and clearly you think about like you just mentioned, the relationships, the sacrifice you have to make, all that sort of thing. And I think when you're in your early 20s, when you're at U23, and you're just in full chase mode, like you were talking about, figuring out the business side, you know, winning bonuses, winning jerseys, salaries are looking better and better, all these different things. That's super exciting. But there's also the human component too of like, what am I missing out on? Um, that I think naturally comes into any athlete's life at some point. Um, you're, I think you're 28 now. Yeah. So you've got plenty of time left, as Nino and a few other guys are showing us, if you want it. Um, but do you have anything else that's kind of like, and this isn't a trick question in any way, but do you have any any other interests that are like kind of creeping into your life a little bit? Or do you find at 28 you're still able to just be 100% like laser beam focused on, on your race goals? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um yeah, personally with me right now, like I'm like to think I'm probably the most focused I've ever been in my life with when it comes to it. You know, like we're in the yeah, the beginning of twenty twenty four and Olympics is coming around and there's a few things I want to do. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, as far as it goes is life after cycling, like I'm not sure exactly what I want to do yet, but I'm very conscious of the fact that what I do is a very selfish job, you yeah. know, like a professional athlete, like you pretty consumed about yourself and putting yourself first and you know like sometimes you hit in the sand and get to work and you don't think twice about it and the people around you are the ones that pick up the pieces a little bit but you know after cycling I definitely want to do something a bit more selfless um I always said that oh yeah after cycling I don't want anything to do it. I want to do something else completely different and there's an element of that because I don't want my identity or me to just be the cyclist Sam you know like I'd like to try offer more uh to the world and to my friends and family than just the athlete but you know at the same time like it brings me a lot of joy giving back and seeing younger riders do well you know um 
and maybe that's something which I would have a lot of passion in after cycling. Uh, and yeah, maybe that's something I can step into or help. I think definitely I want it to be in New Zealand. Mm, I, interesting, yeah. You know, like one of the things that I probably struggle with the most at the moment is the lack of time I actually get down in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I did that because I really started struggling with living on two sides of the world at once almost. You know, you'd jump back into one life and a few months later you're off again and then every time you get little snippets of things, you know. And so for my head and for my mental space, it, it was better for me just to be situated in one place and, you know, it's a big sacrifice. But, you know, after cycling I definitely want to go home and, and make a difference to, yeah, I don't know, 12-year-old Sam uh, who's given it a go for the first time. Yeah, yeah. No, that totally makes sense. Um, so 2016, you get that U23 world title, right? And then was it 17 you won again, back-to-back -back years? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you're on this pretty amazing trajectory, like for someone in your shoes, like the best possible trajectory, really. I it's It sounds bad, man, but I, I looked up your results and you – you won way more races than I even realized. I don't know why I, <laughs> why I missed no, some of that, but just like, you know, you have the, obviously New Zealand national championships, you have the Commonwealth games, plenty of medals there, all that sort of thing. Um, but one thing that I, looking at your results, I did get a really clear picture of is you were on this crazy, crazy build. And then 2019 happened and pretty much everything, from what I can tell, like everything changed. Mm. Um, team changed uh trajectory changed really um and you did your course didn't or your your career didn't change course but it's almost like forked a little bit like there became kind of these two pieces so can you kind of describe for us like that the build 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 maybe what it was like to kind of be on that curve and then what happened in 2019 at cape epic yeah okay uh yeah, I haven't actually spoken, like I've given, like I wanted to do something back at Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, so I really pushed and made my my performance there or my, my race there uh, and wanted to push men's mental health um, mm. with that. And, you know, it's something which, you know, friends and people, some people know I've, I'm quite open about it. I struggle a lot with it. Um, what do you mean? What do you mean for those that don't know, like, Tell me more about that. Like what aspects? So yeah, basically, yeah, July, I'll explain the whole lot, but okay, yeah. July 2019, I was diagnosed with depression. Um, I was actually here in Girona when it happened. Um, but yeah, basically, when I was, yeah, I wasn't having the best time when I was coming up for the U23s and, you know, luck, luckily I was winning bike races. And for me, that was medicine, you know, as long as I was winning, then it was all good. Um, and I had some great times along the way, but I could feel something wild at the time. I didn't know what I was feeling, but like I knew in hindsight now, looking back at it, I wasn't feeling right. And I was coming to a boiling point, but luckily I was still winning and that was masking it a little bit. Um, and 2018 was, you know, a blessing and a curse in a way. Um, you know, I came off, you know, I had my first world title in 2016, which is the best day of my life. Um, my dad there, that was... Hmm. I have to tell that story at some point throughout this podcast because that was sick. Um, Go tell it now. And yeah, okay, we'll start there. We'll start we, we can, um, tangents are great. So, yeah, so I was, yeah, back in 2014, whenever it was, my dad said to me, hey, Sam, when I want to come watch your bike race, I'm going to have to say for a year or two, where do you want me to be? And I was, you know, I've missed the World Championships. So I got third there on a hard tail, so I was like, okay. <laughs> um, Live to tell the tale. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, come there, that's the place. And so... 26 I was very motivated the whole season knowing that my dad was coming to watch Worlds and yeah started amazing won the first two opening World Cups and was definitely ripping um, and about two weeks before my dad arrived I got food poisoning in Dornbin and lost a whole bunch of weight and couldn't train I was fuck, I was beside myself I actually remember being in a family family restaurant at the, uh, the salesman's um, in Dornbin there and I was crying over my food thinking that I'd let my dad down you know he'd spend all his money to come over and watch Worlds I'm not going to be able to do it for him and I had this massive sense of duty that I need to do it and hmm. you know when they got in they went and stayed in Prague for a few days before they went up to Novomesto and I decided that, that was probably best in my head to go spend some time with him um, so I was there in Prague in, my, in the centre of Prague staying there with dad and Amanda my, my dad's partner um, and 
one morning I woke up and I told myself, if I care if I can go do these one minute sprints at the set power, I have a chance. Hmm. Went out, did intervals, it worked. And from that moment forth, it was just phew, mission get this title. Um, and it was just, it was electric from then forth and went out with dad and Amanda uh, to Nova Mesto. And it's just like, yeah, fuck, it's just like being in the family. Like Amanda didn't want to drive and caught the train. We got off at the wrong train stop. It was family <laughs> drama as usual stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it got more and more nervous as the day came through. I got more and more healthier, but I was still super skinny and just on the, on the limit a bit. Um, and yeah, that morning, you know, like I woke up and it was just like being woken up by an ice bath. It was just my lights were on straight away. Um, and I remember sitting in the apartment with Dad and Amanda there and I had my kit and my backpack ready to go and I was so nervous. I was already crying hmm. before I left the hotel room before the race. And big hug, uh, Simon, my teammate, he was standing at the doorway wondering what the fuck is going on. <laughs> <laughs> and went out to the race and... From that moment forth, it was just like something came over me, you know, I was an autopilot, I was ready to go and and told dad that, okay, on the wall, um, it's a long straight climb in Nova Mesto, it's a lap and a half to go, I'm going to I'm gonna go and not look back and if it's meant to be, it's going to happen. And I was counting, in the race, I was just counting down, hmm. my finish line was that climb, and I was counting down the laps to that climb. And Who was in the lead group then? It was... Simon Andreasen, Tatuan Karoj, Victor Kuretsky, and Marcel Guarini was in the front. And Simon actually, what a legend. He was pulling for me straight away from the start. And he really? really? Yeah, yeah. Like huh. he kept the speed high for me. And That's you know, unusual. In my, I mean, obviously yeah, you guys were on the same team, but and I know you're, you're good, good friends, but why do you think he was willing to do that? Just because he's a legend. I think he, was, he also wanted to keep the pace high, and we were quite young too. Huh. I mean, I did ask him to. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he was doing an absolute solid but yeah the race was fast in the start and there was that group of us that were staying together and I still felt electric the whole way through and I was just waiting counting it down the times and I went and looked back and I had clear track behind me and it was a lap and a half to go world championships obviously what happened in Norway as the first year in 23 that the back of me a little bit and I was going a bit scattery and you know there's 20,000 people were up there on that course that day and the, the only spot where there was no one there's dad and Amanda parked up there. No way. And it's like I'm 12 years old in New Zealand again. Yeah. And I just remember dad go saying to me, calm as anything, be in the moment. And that's all he said. And then from that moment forth, I was just fixed in. I don't know where I was, what I was doing. It was just tree, root, rock, go. Um, and it was like that for the remainder of the race. Mm -hmm. And I remember hitting the tarmac with, yeah, 200 meters to go, you go over this little bridge and to straight the finish. And it was literally like having a heart attack. I was almost hmm. hyperventilating on the bike, you know, like realizing what it had done and yeah. coming across the line and all I could think about was finding dad and, you know, I don't know if it's a bit quirky, but, you know, there's movies when someone's looking for their lover in a crowd and lock eyes, it was literally like that with my dad. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, and well, it was just, huh. he brought over, him and Amanda brought over a gift, a uh, greenstone necklace for the uh, for the Salzman's family and hmm. we had dinner together that night. It's the first time they'd met and the Salzman's had done so much for me to that point and wow. it was just... It was amazing. Um, huh. And so, yeah, it was just, that's, yeah, that's it, people. That's my best day of my life. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> it's interesting that you wanted so badly to to win for, for him. And, I mean, I, I get it based on everything you've said thus far in terms of your upbringing and uh, the inspiration that he was for you. But because a lot of young riders, obviously, they want to win for themselves. They're chasing the glory, the, you know, especially when there's a bunch of fans, you know, it, it's amazing to perform in front of thousands of people, but the fact that you were that zeroed in on doing it for just this one other person is pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, Dad did a hell of a lot, and he went through a tough time to support me coming up. So, I mean, it's the least I can do. Um, and I'm a bit like that, you know, like, obviously I really like to win for myself, and I'm a very competitive individual, but, you know, I actually operate best when I feel like I'm riding with someone else almost, you know, mm. if I believe who I'm riding for, what I'm doing, then that's where I probably come out the best. And well, one of the things that really motivated me. So it was definitely, yeah, it was definitely a very special day. Um, so how do you, I mean, that sounds like an absolute life highlight beyond almost anything else. Um, how do you come back the next year and, and still want it? Yeah, I raced the Elite World Cups was my last year in the 23 and it was pretty inconsistent. I mean, I made a podium in Andorra as a U23 in the Elites. But it was not the most consistent season. But 
you know, it was complete different mentality in Ken's. It was more, you know, I had this over, first time I've had this overwhelming feeling of like, oh, all I can do now is lose. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. know, like it's a, it's a bit on me, but yeah, I was in good form and everything worked out well in the day of the race. I mean, to be completely honest, I was half the rider that I was in the year before. Huh. For me to win, if you put Nova Mesto 2016 Sam in front of me and Ken's, I would have dusted myself. You know, mm -hmm. like there's no way I was beating what it was the year before. But it why? Was like, what, why is that? Why do you think you were at a lower level? Uh, I think it was just where I was at. I don't know what it was. I mean, I was definitely very inspired from 2016 and 2017. Was more trying to get it done. Um, it was definitely a good experience for other reasons. The first time trying to defend the title, uh, our title, which was came useful in later career. Um, but you know, like I definitely. I remember being on my bed before the race and I had a duffel bag with all my world's kit and I put it in a duffel bag and put it in the closet. And I told my team manager at the time, like, if I don't win, take that out. I don't want to see it, hmm. you know, because I was just really, there was quite a lot to take on. But it worked out well when mum was there too, which was really nice. Um, and, yeah, it was definitely interesting. But then it just led, you know, after that, it was what else can I do, you know, because obviously – it's quite a lot to back to back world champions at U23 and already podium as U23 Elite World Cups. And I came out swinging in 2018 and I won the first Elite World Cup in Stellenbosch, uh, which was also a very special day. And but at that point, I was at boiling point. Like I was not happy. Um, in my honest opinion, I was acting like a bit of an idiot. Um, and then Com Games and Gold Coast happened and I had a bit of a slip up there and, you know, acted actually in a way that was contradictory to how I actually see myself as a person. Um, basically, yeah, what ha are you good talking about that briefly? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, it's a while ago now and basically it's just I was, and this is nothing on, like, yeah, to be honest, it's like got nothing to do with Anton and in the day, like a lot of it was just myself trying to be the best I possibly can and Anton was always a bit better than me growing up. This and is Anton it, Cooper, who's yeah, also from New Zealand. Yeah. Long, long time uh, top World Cup guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, really good bike rider. And yeah, like there was, we had a few scuffles, but like as racing and we're super competitive with each other. And I felt in myself that I lost Glasgow through an Australian, Dan McConnell, not sprinting. Um, yeah, he was second wheel behind Anton and just didn't flinch. And, Anton sprinted away and won and I had to get around Dan and went until it opened up. And so I definitely wasn't stoked on that. Um, and so coming back to Gold Coast, like I, in my head, in my head, like I just come off winning a World Cup and I, I wanted to show to myself and to everyone in my young hothead age that I was the best. Um, and I was racing the road race as well. So in my head in the race, I was trying to conserve as much as I could while winning the race and getting ready for the road race. Um, and I was just riding nervous and I made a mistake and got a flat tyre. And I just remember a lap and a half to go, I'm riding around 10 PSI on my rear tire and Anton's with me and I'm just thinking, oh, I've just screwed this up again. And I remember going through the finish line and I was thinking, okay, do I change the flat and try to come back or do I just ride this and I'm guaranteed bronze? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, last second, I was like, right, I'm gonna change the flat. Just went in and then as I went in, Anton saw, slammed down some gears and sprinted off. Yeah. And then that was just enough to turn me over the edge. But I was also, you know, it wasn't even just the race. I was dealing with a lot at the time uh, outside of the competition. And, you know, I think it just overflowed in the wrong way. Um, you know, on one side it was definitely, yeah, something I really don't like. And on the other side, it's probably the reason why I still won because I was just enraged and yeah. closed down like 27 seconds or so in half a lap and managed to come back to win. So, <laughs> that's so great. I'd actually, I never had a power meter on for that race, but I honestly believe that's probably one of the best files I've yeah. had that last Unreal. lap. Yeah, um, but no, I mean, I definitely paid for that. I mean, it was definitely... Because then you basically like flipped him the bird as you were yeah, I mean, I, across. it was a good... To, to be, finish the story. Yeah, to finish the story, the part <laughs> I didn't want to the, tell. The context, <laughs> I'm sorry, man, but there are going to be people that are like, yeah. what, what's wrong with closing down 30 seconds? That sounds yeah, bad. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone got a really good photo, actually. Oh, really? Uh, if you see the video, it was just me from a hand up, like a, like an angry Italian or something like this. Um but yeah, my finger was just killed just right and someone got the photo and there you go. Um, so that came out, but yeah, I didn't even register that I did it to be honest. Um, and then I came across the line and 
you know, something didn't really sit right. No, it didn't sit right with me and how I was acting at the time anyway. Um, and so I actually, one thing that I'm always going to be glad I did is I rang my dad after the podium and told him that I think I did that and I feel awful for it and I screwed it up. And I, at this point, I didn't know anyone knew anything. I was just like, oh, fuck. And I remember riding back to the village, I had the gold medal in my backpack and just, oh, felt awful. And then sure enough, I get back into the village, everyone's stoked, go into my bed, phone goes ding, goes ding again, starts going off, I check my phone and there's the photo. Yeah. And I just broke down the tears and I was cooked. Um, and it was actually, it was a bit of a storm in a teacup a little bit, you know, like I think New Zealand media really grabbed onto it and yeah, it felt like the whole world was against me. And like, I don't, in my opinion, like I don't, yeah, obviously it wasn't ideal what I did and I apologize at the time for it. Um, but it was actually really unhealthy how much flack I caught mm. to as a 22 year old, you know, like my yeah. mum my, my was getting harassed. Oh, I was man. getting sent death threats. Oh, the whole media was killing me, you know, like I had like an hour's sleep after the race, the next day I had to do the recon for the road race and then go to the New Zealand media. I apologized to a room of like 200 people, which I wanted to do. Um, and then the media came and I had one guy come to me, he goes, all right, let's do the interview. I was like, yeah, sweet. And I was just, fuck, I was just like trying not to run off and spew in the bathroom. And he goes, are you sorry? He goes, all right, let's go, put it in my face. He goes, are you sorry? Oh no, he goes, is Anton Cooper a bad sport? And I was like, no, he's not. I just like to try to give him a good answer. And he just repeats the question again and I gave my answer, repeats it again. And then uh, Ian Hipshaw, the, actually I don't know if I should be saying this or not, but here we are. <laughs> um, Ian Hipshaw, the, the media support from New Zealand was being great. And he told him the next question and then he goes, are you sorry? And I gave my answer. He goes, how sorry are you? And he starts following me with the microphone on my face. Yeah, How crazy. sorry are you? How so I'm a 22 year old kid, mate. Yeah. Like, it was crazy. It was like I murdered someone. Um, and then, yeah, I ran off to the bathroom, had a spew, uh, apologized more, went back, tried to sleep, and then got up and went to the road race. And so after that, like, that was a massive hit for me because, yeah, I just couldn't, like, for sure, I deserved some flack. What I did was stupid. Um, and, I took shine away from where New Zealand mountain biking was at. But at the same time, it just seemed pretty wild, you know, like even, you know, people in the New Zealand community, New Zealand are making assumptions. Like I saw some of the articles making assumptions about how my background was, my family and mm. financially and what I'm like. And I just read this stuff and I'm like, this is, I feel like I'm so misunderstood. For sure I did something dumb, like I said, but it was just really a lot to take on as a 22 year old. And so here I am half overseas on the best mountain biker in the world at 22 years old, has won the opening world cup and bet Nino had a perfect season the year before. And then back home, um, you know, public enemy number one, it felt like I wasn't, the reality was I wasn't. And it was just, but it whole, feels like it when, when your entire world is shooting arrows at you, you think it's the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it did, but it was, oh, it was, intense and then i came back and i tried to race throughout the season and i won uh i got second in the alpstead short track stunt problems in the xco won the Nova mesto short track um and then crashed out in the xco and i had problems throughout the whole year but i was just fuck, i was surviving and then i came back to a reasonably good level for Mont world cup before the worlds had a bad crash again um broke some bones and did some damage and then went back to new zealand from there and still trying to process what happened, processing myself and my stuff. I couldn't really do it so well, but I was just keeping it going, you know, like, and then, yeah, I came over to, I came into 2019 trying to prove a point to myself and just get my career back on track. You know, there was a lot of pressure I felt like on myself at that point. And you had Cape Epic that I was wanted to be at. Um, and yeah, just two weeks before, Cape Epic, I was supposed to leave. I found out my mum was diagnosed with breast cancer, stage two, and they still wanted me to race. Um, well, I was still down to race, so I went along and raced. Got to the first stage and had a, I was just we 20Ks from the finish. There was 
Scott Schramm, Kenyon, uh, Kenandale, and Yaroslav and myself lifting the race. And I was just going down a Jeep track trying to look at the kilometers left to go on my on my head mount. And then a branch caught my hand, flicked me over, and I hit the back of my head at 40k an hour or so. And then knocked me silly. Um, and then from then, yeah, that was done. Uh, and then, yeah, you give, well, how old was I there? 23 or so. So we're 23 year old living by himself in Girona with a massive concussion of all this going on. Didn't really have, I closed myself off a little bit for a few months and then the downward spiral happened uh, and it kept going, didn't stop. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, yeah, okay, I can't get much worse than this and it kept on getting worse. Um, and yeah, to be honest, I, I haven't spoken openly about this before publicly. I've just been, obviously my people know about it, but I think it's, I'm okay with doing it now, but you know, like I was out training on hours and I was doing training rides and I was just bursting into tears every training ride, couldn't ride my bike. Yeah. And it got to the point where a uh, really important person in my life now, Dr. David Spindler is a neuroscientist and we're super close still. Uh, he basically said to me, Sam, you're not, you're not riding your bike, it's not healthy anymore, it's not good for you, mm. um, it's not safe. So then I went and got uh, checked up, got diagnosed properly and part of ways I specialised. Uh, I actually was speaking to much earlier uh, about Amstel or some, I think it was Amstel that he won and it's on the situation and Philip Rodolf messaged me and wanted me to become part of the team. I went to Alperson and started to get back training again. And as I was getting back into work and training, I was excited for 2020. I still wasn't recovered. I was still on antidepressants and really unhealthy, but I still was in my head. I wanted to race my bike and then COVID happened. <laughs> And so just as I started, I didn't even do a bike race, COVID happened and then, yeah, I was back home in New Zealand. I went back there for it and I was, yeah, two or three months or whatever it was, not knowing what I was doing in my life with all this going on. It was yeah. definitely interesting, but, you know, I just, yeah, when I was back there, I was, didn't know whether I wanted to carry on or not. I was really a bit of a stuck point and I remember having a conversation with my dad on the, on the terrace outside the house, just trying to, I was literally having a conversation like, yeah, that's it. Like, this is curtains closed, you know? Like, it's good while it lasted. Still did all right, you know? Um, and then with that conversation and a few more, I decided, no, like, I'm going to give it another go. Um, and so, yeah, when I left, I, <laughs> I promised Dad that I'll be world champion by the time I next see him again. And, yeah, I saw him after I won Worlds again. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, then, I want to rewind quickly. So... When you, we glossed over it super quickly, but <clears throat> you won the opening round of the 2018 World Cup, beat Nino, snapped his streak. He was, he was unbeaten in 2017, which is just still hard it's to wrap your head around. Yeah. But to be, you know, knowing, knowing your personality at that time, um, to be the one that snaps that streak combined with like these other factors that are going on where it seemed like you weren't the healthiest um emotionally mentally all that sort of thing yeah um what was that like because you just said you were unhappy when you won which is a crazy th i mean you just beat nino schroeder in an epic sprint finish like people can go pull it up on youtube it was amazing to watch um you were unhappy at the time though yeah, like, don't get me wrong. Like, I was stoked to yeah. win that race. Um, but I guess what i The best I'm, way I can describe it is just sheet over your head. You know, everything's a bit more dimmer. And okay. back then I thought it was normal when it just wasn't, you know. Um, so I was stoked still. I mean, it was amazing. Um, that was a crazy old race. And, you know, it was, yeah, it was weird. Um, I don't want to sound like a bit too much of a loony right now, but, you know, even – had a, not the dream of night before, maybe was like too long ago, but I had a dream that I was walking through the field with the World Cup's leaders jersey on the day before the race. <laughs> Crazy, yeah. And I was, yeah, no, I couldn't believe it. It gave me the shakes, even thinking about it now, and woke up that day and, you know, Jumanji, uh, my mechanic, and still we were together at Specialized as well. We, I was quite nervous before the race, and he looked at me and goes, you're the fastest guy in the world. There's no one better than you riding a bike right now. Look after your material, no punctures, be smooth, and you'll do what you want. And then, again, it was just lock me in, just those are the right words. And that was from that moment forth, I was on a mission, you know, and everything worked out well during the race and I put a bit of pressure on Nino doing a bit more work and sort of, yeah, 
tried to, to pound some of the responsibility onto him for the push and the speed and waited and you know the last lap I was definitely on my last legs going up the first climb the first half of the last lap and I was sort of pokering my poker facing it through but I was yeah on the limit um and then I knew that whoever was leading going into the finish would control or dictate the way the sprint turned out um so I just literally any chance it opened up I sprinted and when it was closed I cruised and just tried <laughs> yeah, to yeah, keep yeah, yeah. control that way and then yeah the sprint happened how it did um yeah, I guess what I'm what I was getting at with that is it's interesting how because earlier you mentioned you weren't necessarily always the happiest um, outside of the races, off the bike, maybe even during training. But the winning was helping, and it was almost like this band aid. But eventually, like that wasn't even enough. Like you won in this insane fashion, snapping Nino streak, um, and it does, didn't necessarily give you the same fix so yeah. to speak i mean it definitely did i think there's pre and post com games mm, oh gotcha yep yeah like Fair. stella Mosh was before commies and so i was definitely sky high coming in to com games um but then afterwards obviously that happened and yeah i that didn't changed get, everything yeah it changed a lot it yeah. changed a lot um and then obviously 2019 i didn't get opportunity to win i just crash happened pretty early in the season with cape epic and then yeah then it all really Got going. Um, Why do you think Alpeson wanted to bring you on? I, other than the op, like you, amazing talent, great results, but um, why do you think that match ended up happening? Obviously, it's been a great fit, but at the time, why do you think it happened? I think, yeah, like Matcha and I, we got on, uh, we get on, and you know we're racing each other quite a lot in 2018. Um, him and I came to a sprint finish for the Short Track World Cup, and I've missed her where, where I bit him and. Then Stellenbosch, he was fourth in the World Cup race. Uh, so we knew each other quite well. Um, well, professionally quite well. Um, and then obviously he's, yeah, he has up us in the Koenig team. He's been, yeah, one of the longest members, the longest member of that team, um, a rider of that team. And I think, you know, Philip and Christoph are really good at talent identification and sort of been nurturing or bringing riders to a really high level from a young age. And... I think they saw some potential to bring me back on track and you know it was, it was definitely a, a lot they offered me the tools to be able to do it and it was up to me whether I wanted to come back or not you know like I still had to get out and do the training and yeah. and work hard and mold, turn myself into a full a professional rider you know like a lot of things that I was doing was wrong still at Specialized um it's actually funny now I'm trying to do everything right I look back at some of the races I won when I wasn't doing everything right I'm saying how the do I do that? <laughs> what were some of the mistakes you made, do you think? Oh, dude, just the diets and just gotcha, yeah. Yeah, sleeping normal properly stuff. and just the yeah. normal stuff, the one percenters. Um, and so definitely Upperson de Koenig taught me to be professional. Actually, I think Christoph de Kegel, who's my coach now, um, he has been since I've been at Alperson. He's a massive figure in my career and, you know, he, he's taught me an incredible amount and he has a lot of belief in me, which more than myself at some points and, you know, between – him and the brothers and the whole program there they really brought me into being a full professional and climbed on back and they gave me the space and the freedom to be able to do so you know like there was no pressure um they're really quite good about me taking my time and trying my best to get back into good form and yeah i probably would have been a bit of a handful that first year because i was still quite ill um and it was definitely pretty challenging for me at times and you know but then yeah just I think a lot of the reason why I am, well, why I've been lucky to be so successful the past two seasons um, has up us into Koenig to thank yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you excited to get the opportunity to race on the road some again? Because you mentioned earlier, you know, that that junior kiddo who was like, I don't think I'm cut out for the road. I don't think I'm good enough for this. And ultimately you went back towards mountain bike for that reason. And then all of a sudden you kind of, Kind of went circle full circle. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was it like? Did you know right off the bat that you're going to be doing a good bit of road? Was that part of the offer? Yeah. So actually, I was stage rearing for Quick Step in 2019. Still, so an effort to keep me racing and to keep me uh, moving. I had a went and did some testing of Quick Step, and they like what they saw, and they gave me a guest ride. Um, so that was fun. But yeah, I was just shell of myself. I mean, I was I had some good rides there for sure, but I was just shadow um 
And so I always wanted to come back to the road at some point or try the road again. Um, you know, when I went to the mountain bike, somehow I grew a bunch of muscle from doing all the explosive stuff and got a bit <laughs> yeah. more stronger. So I thought there was the, my weaknesses that I didn't have on the road in the early days, I had gained from doing full mountain bike. Um, and so in year 23, like I tried to go to the worlds and I went and did some Kiramises in Belgium and won one. And I never really, for some reason, didn't get selected for year 23 worlds. Um, and then in Norway, I really wanted to go there. And then, yeah, Alperson, they saw potential or see potential in me on the road as well. And we sort of adapted the program to that. And, you know, the road really helps with the performance of the mountain bike too and sort of the engine building side. And, you know, my biggest, I'll put my hand up and say pretty openly, my, my, my biggest weakness in racing is my consistency. And, yeah, the road definitely helps with that mm. and teaches you pretty quickly that you can be suffering and still push on. So, yeah, it's been really good. And... It's been a massive opportunity. Like I've been involved now with, yeah, some, some pretty big road races. And, you know, definitely I think the most memorable one would be my first Kerner. Um, I mean, we had a bit of a – unfortunately, it didn't work out in the final with Tim Millier, But, you know, to be in a final of a big classic like that and to become a fifth around the last corner and to be right there and in, in the thick of it. And that was pretty cool, you know. And I actually probably remember – yeah, I remember – we did like a final circuit. So you come in and you do one and a half laps of this local loop in the final corner and it's a long finish straight, slight downhill. Um, and you can see the, the finish line, the people from 700 meters away. And I remember flying down there with a lap to go, all lined out, hearing the helicopters above you, seeing the people go past like you're in a car. <laughs> and it was just, it was surreal. It was like, yeah, we made it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like kidding. we're doing it, you know? Um, oh, yeah. And so, yeah, it's been really quite nice. And I did the Vuelta after Mountain Bike Worlds this year. I got viral infection on day two, so it didn't really last long, but <laughs> still was there and part of a few stage wins or a couple of stage wins while I was there and it was super fun. And yeah, I definitely think maybe it's something that could suit my capabilities and I really want to, it'd be a dream to be in the final with Flanders or Roubaix one day. That would be pretty special to be able to be rubbing shoulders among the Titans and be able to, you know, say I contributed to a race like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, this is, <clears throat> as we started the conversation with, this is kind of the time of year when you're daydreaming, falling asleep at the night, think, falling asleep at night thinking about these things. Um, so what gets you the most fired up right now, this winter? Is it imagining yourself in that scenario in the final of one of the big classics, or is it the fact that you are 19 seconds off XCO world title with an imperfect day, all of the 20, above. 29th of July is what gets me out of bed at the moment. You know, gotcha. that's, the Olympics is the biggest thing right now for me. Um, you know, the Worlds was great last year. I came up short and had a bit of unlucky start loop and, you know, I was traveling at good speed at that race and I definitely believe that I could do something at Olympics. You know, like I'm... Um, I'm not going to fool myself into thinking I'm like one of these titans, you know, like a Vanderpool or a Pidcock or one of these top, top, top legends of the sport. Yeah. But I mean, in a way, though, like as I was going through your results, it's funny. I, I hope I don't get lit up on the Internet for this, but because <laughs> sometimes I'll say I'll say stuff that's maybe like one percent too far. But if you if you go down your results and you look at the people that were in the race, um, I guess kind of the only other than the road success, which is significant, but you have the opportunity to do that. If you can find um, like on paper, you have the capability to be one of those guys, right? You have a closet full of world titles, jerseys. You beat Nino at his absolute peak. Um, and right now the sport is like, as a whole, we're kind of infatuated with these Swiss army knives of, of Vanderpool, of Pidcock, right? But, you know, on paper, like, you're you're one of those guys. Do you find yourself... How much do you compare yourself to them? Can you, can you like, stay somewhat level-headed and realize that you still have to prove that consistency, like, find find a level on the road to, to really be one of those guys? Do you dream about it, or is it just kind of like, I'm going to do my own thing, I'm going to focus on Olympic mountain bike and not bite off more than... Yeah, well, I, can chew. I don't know whether that's just my confidence these days or what, but I do not see myself as the same level as these guys. Like, you know, I when it comes to 
comparing, you know, like obviously being on the same team as Machu and seeing him in training, I obviously you want to be as best as possibly can, but I also see that as the benchmark as the best rider in the world. And that's what the very best can do. And, you know, these guys are, I don't know so much about, you know, your Pidcocks or your Pachekas or your Van Arts or anything like this, but, you know, like Matthew is, it's not even just about the results of that guy, like the way he turns himself inside out in training. How mentally yeah, strong we hear is. that. Like, is that yeah. hyperbole or is it actually something more? No, no, it's a legit thing, man. This guy is. What know. do you like? Can you describe for people, like, on a just paint us a picture, like, on a, any given day, you're in team camp. What is Vanderpool doing that the other guys aren't? Well, put, I hope he doesn't. I hope he doesn't mind me saying this. Um, <laughs> you can but, shoot him a text and we'll cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably one of the most memorable things we're in a plunger at an altitude camp and there's like an hour climb to the hotel every day and he loves the race like the first you get you just send down the hill and after five minutes he's gone for most of the day um he's off front racing. no there's like a couple guys on the team that want to race with him um a couple <laughs> teammates and we're all really tired this one day and we're going up and we have the hour long climb back to the hotel and he looks at the group and he goes pain is only between your ears and then he just takes off and goes for a strawberry temp up an hour long climb <laughs> like that's the guy that he is, you know, and it's admirable for sure. Um, and so, yeah, I don't compare myself to guys like that. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. just, he's another breed. And it's awesome to witness it. I'm really grateful to be in this era of cycling and really, you know, like, I think honestly, one of the things which I think I'm really grateful for is, you know, like, you can always sit there and be like, oh, I could do more, I could make it. Like, I haven't made it yet, I haven't made it yet. And that's, I'm pretty guilty of that sometimes too. I never feel like I've done enough. Um, but then, to be in the same team and to be able to win the same bike, bike races as these guys that is a household name around the world. Like it's it's quite an opportunity. I'm quite grateful to be able to even see it. You know, like that's how my, it's probably one of my measures of knowing that I've had a good career. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, but like in saying that as well, like, you know, for the 29th of July, it's no secret. Uh, I don't know how much it might be racing or not, might not be. Um, Tom has said that he'll be racing. Uh, you know, like, I don't see myself as great as these guys, but the great thing I love about championship events is, yeah, there's no status, there's no nothing. It's just Best 90 rider. minutes. Exactly. Yeah. And that will figure a lot of things out. And yeah. I believe for one day I can do it. Yeah. And so that's my goal. And that's what, I'm, that's what I'm training for. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, it is interesting. I guess I bring up the comparison to those guys just because, you know, physiologically – you do kind of strike me as like a, like a lot of your strengths are sort of like Vanderpool strengths where you're just super explosive. You can cross over. Um, and then, basically just a dollar shop. I met you Vanderpool. <laughs> <laughs> Vanderpool light. Yeah. Vanderpool light. Um, yeah. I mean, and then you will pop off these things like that world's ride where I mean, you were 19 seconds off Pidcock. Like that is amazing. That is really amazing. Um, that's cool, man. If there's, so spending one more minute on kind of these uh, these folks that are crossing over and, and uh, like redefining what it means to be a, a top athlete, top cyclist. Is there anyone that's totally focused on the road now um, that you think would cross over well onto the dirt, whether it's XC, well, yeah, I guess just XCO or short track? Hard to say, like there's so many young talents these days. Yeah. Like the young rider that won the – Stage at Tour Down Under. Oh, that dude. was incredible. Eh? What? Yeah. I saw that highlight and I was just like, oh my God. Yeah. When you see the Y'all speed. Y'all are in for it. <laughs> you see the speed difference? It's like, Del Toro? But, that's his yeah, name? Yeah, yeah. Del Toro. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. Like, I think it's quite cool in modern cycling that young athletes, woman or male, can yeah. choose a discipline and have the freedom over what they want to do. Um, I think it's really quite cool for the sport and cool for them as well, just to, to have the free, like to have the, the freedom and be able to follow their passion on whether it's two point four tires or twenty eight mil tires, you know. Um, but it's hard to say. I mean, Adrian Boshi, he's a young French rider, um, U twenty three. I think he's going to be very exceptional when he's older. Mm. He's well, he's already really quite a strong rider. He's progressing well. I think he's going to be one of the future stars in mountain bike. Um, but as far as it goes to the road, like, yeah, I actually don't know enough young riders to be able to have a educated opinion on that. I mean, whoever it is, just stay away for another four or five years so I can do one thing, <laughs> then you can come. It's getting crowded. Just let me, yeah, because 
Well, that's the bit by the time I do get good enough to win the league world title, then there'll be some young guy who just beats me anyway. <laughs> Fair, enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Cool, man. That was great. Um, I'm trying to think what else. What is your schedule this year? So, yeah, I start pretty soon. I'm doing a small marathon race. Um, but we didn't Durham. even talk about marathon worlds or two short track, elite short track world champs. <sighs> Took the jersey off our beloved Chris Blevins back. Yeah, that was Bastard. a Yeah, sorry, mate. <laughs> I mean, Chris was, he was committed that race. Poor, given yeah. that. <laughs> Tried to put his bike where there was no room. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it's actually funny. Like when we talk about the Elite World title, like, you know, this year, obviously on paper, I got pretty close. I was 19 seconds off and after a bad start loop. But if you ask me which one I've thrown away, it's 2022. Like mm. the XCO World title race there, I, yeah, I threw that one away. Um, which was pretty hard to take, and it still was a bit raw of me. Um, and so Marathon Worlds was yeah, two weeks later or two and a half weeks later, and I actually, out of not spite, but out of being pissed at myself, I managed to make that one work. Um, Didn't you break your collarbone right before that? Yeah, trip? I broke my collarbone and two ribs, <laughs> and then raced Marathon Between Worlds. Between the two, and they were two weeks apart? Two and a half weeks apart. And you broke it after XCO, before Marathon Worlds? Yeah, I broke my collarbone and ribs two weeks before. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I drove poor Amy, uh, my girlfriend, up the wall. Basically, yeah, just everything was going so swimmingly in the XO race. Like, to be honest, I mean, it's a hindsight now, so I can say it, but, like, I was too concerned over where Tom Pickcock was. You know, like, he was, we started on the same road, but I made it to the front a lot quicker than he did, and I was sort of waiting for him to come, Then I knew the race was probably going to get faster from then on out. Um, and then I was just, you, like, just trying to see how... You know, I was feeling Jordan Saru was also in the front, so I wanted to see how he was feeling and just sort of trying to pick everything I can and all the small details I can yeah. put together. And, you know, I was like a step up, step down, little bike park section, and we are going pretty quick, so I just wanted to scrub the bike. Um, a lot of people actually thought I was trying to whip and crash, so <laughs> just disclaimer, I was not trying to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I was not, <laughs> but I was just trying to roll the bike over the lip just to keep it lower to the ground, uh -huh. uh, just scrubbing it. And... As I went off that lip, my back wheel had a rock funny and just flipped me over. Yeah. And I just couldn't do anything about it. I just remember it happening and being like, oh. And then just obviously the crash happened. So that was really hard to take because, you know, I felt really good. And we're at the 20 minute mark, 25 minute mark. And usually, you know, if you paced it wrong after 15 minutes, you find out. Um, I still felt really good. So I knew I was on for a good day. And then that happened. So, yeah, I. I I had to drive overnight. I got airlifted to a French hospital. Uh, the team wanted to do the surgery in Belgium with their doctors. So then I drove overnight in a van, my collarbone out of place to Heron Tales. Got How there. long was that drive? 10 hours. Oh my God, dude. Yeah. Ugh. It was a long night of staring at the highway. I'll tell you that for free. <laughs> <laughs> I got to the yeah, hospital in Belgium and did the surgery and got home. And I think that afternoon or the next morning, I was on the turbo already. So. Wow, yeah. And then, yeah, it was just all in for Marathon Woods to right my wrongs a little bit, and it worked out. Um, it was actually, poor, it was a hard race. That was, um, I sort of, in my head, I was training, like, there's going to be a moment when you're going to want to break, and that's where you get the proof, or that's when I can get out what I want to get out. Um, and somehow I just jumped into a single trail, and there was a rider who wasn't going so quick there, so I jumped in front of him and got, like, a 10-second gap pretty quickly. It was, like, an hour to go, and it was quite, like, a drafty course, and... I was like, oh, I've got to go. Um, and so I basically just had a drag race with four people chasing me down and me 20 seconds up the road for an hour. Oh. And yeah, I was oh, I was falling to bits because every time I got out of the saddle, like my collarbone was fine because it was plated. Yeah. It was my ribs that was doing the damage, yeah. you know, like, and the collarbone was always all good um, as it can be for being yeah. <laughs> broken. But then like, you know, like I remember waking up in the middle of the night before the week after I got back from hospital and like I had muscle cramps in between my broken ribs. Yeah. And it's like I, what I felt like it would be to be 90 years old getting out of bed is how I felt. Yeah. And so, yeah, I went to the race and like that last hour I could feel everything and it was really starting to get tender. And Andreas and Wild came back to me in like 20 minutes to go and I managed to, yes, we didn't even do the sprint. We sat up before the sprint. So I just rolled across the line, which was really the strangest footage we had for the world title. Um, <laughs> But then, yeah, I woke up the next morning and I could not move. Wow. I tried to do, I wanted to do Sea Otter Classic, the local race in Girona here. Yeah. Because I always loved doing it. Um, but I couldn't ride a bike anymore. Like I was broken. So 
yeah, that was definitely put some stuff to bed for me in 2022. Um, yeah, well, so that's impressive. There's a time. Um, all right, we should wrap this up with your uh, your schedule for the year. I think people yeah. would be curious to hear. Other than, what'd you say? Is it July 29th? Yeah, 29th of July. Yeah. So um, what, what are you doing to uh, keep yourself occupied until then? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, training my butt off, basically. <laughs> no, I mean, I'll do, yeah, at the moment, I'll do a bunch of races in February. I'll do like a small two-day marathon uh, run by, they call Vol- Volcat. It's quite local, um, which would be nice. And then I'll do La Nucia, uh, C1. I'll do Shalva and then Bagnoles, which are all quite big Spanish early spring races. So I'll do that on the mountain bike. I'll go directly into altitude camp again um, after Bagnoles and then prepare, do some road races uh, and work towards the Brazil, the first World Cups in Brazil. So What road races are you doing? Uh, still to be confirmed. Uh, but it's looking like something quite local in Spain and maybe a one-day race in Belgium. Yeah, so, right on. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot we can't – teams are funded with that. We can't really shout it out publicly per se. Well, yeah. People I, can I, probably put two and two together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just it hasn't been confirmed yet. Yeah, yeah, out yeah. Of, You know, there's a lot of guys trying to get into races. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll see. But everything going well, I'll be doing some road racing too, uh, which I'm looking forward to. And – then yeah, I really want to show up in, in Brazil in April because, you know, I've had a lot, I've been really grateful for the success I have had, but I still haven't won a World Cup apart from Stellenbosch, mm-hmm. and that's been eluding me a while. Yeah. And I actually would love, love to win a World Cup again. So that's one of the goals for my season as well, um, along with like the, the consistency and of course the Olympics. So just that, and you know, for me, the two things which the left of mountain biking that I really want to do is the elite world XCI world title and the Olympics. And if I can one day touch wood, check those two off, then I'll be a very happy man. And this year is a good opportunity for it. So yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny before we started recording, you also mentioned, uh, I would not have expected this, but you're like, yeah, I miss whiskey 50 and <laughs> Sea Otter classic. Cause I mean, obviously you like testing, testing yourself against the best in the world. And, and those races are, not quite the same level, but they seem to hold a, a special place in your heart. They're so sick. Like, I love them. Like, why, is, why is that? Well, it's just... So, when I was back in New Zealand growing up, we had this race called the Colville Connection. You know, it was just this... Basically, now you'd call it a gravel race. 100% would be a gravel race. But it was just around the peninsula of Coromand- of up top of Coromandel. Um, but it was a really local feel to the race and community-based. And we gotcha. used to, we used to tent in yeah. camp for the race and the year that I finally bit my dad when I was 16 I was using his old bike and the seat was four centimeters too low for me because the frame was too small and you know there's so many good memories in that style of racing and so when I come to Whiskey 50 I remember getting there after Seattle and we were going for a walk around Prescott and there was this dog sitting in a passenger seat of a car and no one was in the car and I thought that was awesome because that reminds me back of being in New Zealand and so we're looking at the dog I'm there like, yeah just not cheering a dog on, what am I calling it, pampering the dog. Um, and the guy comes out and that's actually the guy who runs the event. Yeah, Todd. Todd, yeah. yeah. And so I was like, this is sick. And then <laughs> we did the, uh, my first ever professional win was there at the short track. Was it? Yep. First oh. time I ever won a professional bike race. That's cool. Um, as a pro. Nasty short track, that one. Huh? It was, eh? <laughs> oh. um, All paved, but at 1900 meters maybe maybe more 2100 it is it's basically it's just hill repeats yeah and 1900 meters altitude and it is roofless yeah. um but anyway so that was a sick race and then but the thing i loved the most about it was so the the marathon race you go up the skull valley i think it's called yeah. turn left do a u-turn climb your ass back up and then go down a half an hour descent yeah as i was going down this half an hour descent i had 20 seconds or 30 seconds on Howie who was behind me. Yeah. Um, and I come around this corner and there's no one in the middle. There's no one there. Like it's middle of nowhere. Yeah. I come around the corner, there's like 200 people in this one rock garden screaming. Yeah. And I was like, where do all you people come from? Like, how'd you get out here? And I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Mountain and then, people. Mountain people. Nah, <laughs> just people that make the races worth it. You know, those people coming out and having a good time, which I, I loved. Um, but then, yeah, got to the finish line and, the whole atmosphere was amazing. We went and did a whiskey shot in the local pub. Um, and it was it was sick. So, you know, like events like these, like I haven't done Leadville yet. I would really love to do Leadville really? one day. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know who has a record now, but I know Susie was close to it, if not had it. Keegan has a nasty, I have news for you, dude. Keegan did an absolutely stupid ride last year. He did a steamer. He went uh, 17 minutes faster than Alban Licata. 17. Five, I think it's 543. You should go, I'll, mm, I don't know if he still has the file up. Dude. I'll send you the file. It it's it's really insane. Did he do it but on anyway. a mountain bike or did he do it on yeah, a mountain yeah, bike? Yeah, hardtail. But he did a bunch of funky stuff. Like he ran, ran like a big one by road kind of crank, uh, crank set, just bigger chain ring. Uh, kind of. I think he cut his bars down. He ran like gravel wheels and narrow yeah. tires. Kinda. Anyway, he went the full nine yards. Worth it and seven. Oh, okay. Maybe that's not going to happen for me then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, it'd be cool to be a part of it though, you know, and like, oh, one thing I forgot too is the dude letting off the shotgun to announce the start of Whiskey 50. Oh, yeah. That was sick. We used to have that back in like, we used to, Black Stump was the name of the event and it was like this on some cocky's farm, sheep and beef farm, we used to do like laps of this farm. And yeah, same thing, shotgun on the back of the ute, boom, off you go. And I, was, I find that so cool. Yeah. So. <laughs> Dude, U.S. gravel race, if you love that stuff, once you uh, check these last couple of boxes on the global stage, U.S. gravel's waiting for you. Yeah, it'd be sick. I mean, <laughs> I always thought it would be a cool idea to, like, me and one of my best mates have talked about it, just renting a motorhome and just driving around and doing all the crits and all the stuff in America and just, yeah, living it up for one year before we properly let go of it, you know, so. Lawrence Tendam style. Yeah, I mean, oh, it seems like such a good idea, eh? <laughs> and, like, you know, I definitely think that it's, it's really quite a nice, fun way and you can take it as competitive as you like or just get out there and do it. And, yeah. you know, like I think it's just, a, yeah, I like to do it one day and yeah. see. Cool, man. Thanks for the time. This no, is awesome. No, happy to be here and thanks a lot. And, yeah, look forward to, well, I probably won't listen to this back, but <laughs> Amy, Amy will and she let me know if it's good or not. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, shout out to your, your girlfriend. What's her podcast? Uh, Women's Cycling Weekly. Women's it's, Cycling Weekly. Yeah, cool. yeah, so she's just doing her thing. Um, yeah, she's been a journalist of women's cycling now for a few years and has a big passion in it and follows it. We have a good friend, Tilda Price, is not doing the uh, podcast over anymore. Tilda's now with GCN, so. But no, she's, uh, yeah, keen on following the women's side of the sport. Uh, she actually follows the women's side, not so much the men's side. I think she <laughs> has passion in the men's side now that I'm doing it. Yeah, fair. I think it's quite cool. So, yeah, it's uh, it's nice, you know, like she's not, professional cyclist by any means um but she knows enough to have an idea of how to handle it you know and yeah we've been together long enough she knows how to deal with my wacky ass so she just yeah <laughs> she does a great job with that <laughs> good stuff man all right well so, uh best of luck we'll be following so until next time